We're here this week with John Wanberg, investor, real estate agent, team owner, property manager, and home flipper to talk about how to find the best deals in Orlando. Home buyers, sellers, investors, even brokers, we're all searching for a greater advantage, greater benefit, and greater result in our real estate transactions. And we want to enjoy the process and have balanced and fulfilling lives along the way. So how do we accomplish all this in a market that's competitive, constantly changing, and crowded with choices? The Don Harkins Real Estate Show is dedicated to providing that answer. So John, thanks for joining us this week. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to be here. So. Uh, absolutely, man. Appreciate you coming down. So John, I met uh, your partner, Eddie, um, gosh, probably a couple years ago now at a training event. It was... Uh, train the trainer and we had to get up and do a big speech afterwards it was a great keller williams class but i was sitting next to him and uh we were talking he's like you know did this deal did this deal how many houses did you sell and he told me you guys did like 300 houses or something in one of the years okay yeah um and i was like man i'm doing like 30 houses so i knew i knew you guys were doing a big business um we got to know each other more and more and more it's been a big help but um, I told him we wanted to bring somebody on who was an expert at finding good deals because we all want to get the best deal in real estate. Even if we're selling, we want to get the best deal. An investor wants to get the best deal. And sure, um, he mentioned that uh, you were the expert on his team at finding deals. So um, tell me a little bit about how you got started in real estate and um, how you became the expert at finding real estate deals. Sure. So um I don't know, expert may be, uh, may be a little bit of a stretch there, but that's kind of been my role for the last probably about six months. And so initially, Eddie and I partnered in about 2011. I started in 2009. So in 2009, you know, I had lost my job, short selling my house, yeah. so completely broke and the market was tanking at the time. So yeah. it was a perfect time to get started in real estate sure. when you're swimming, swimming upstream. But um, ultimately, you know, I worked together with Eddie for two years. Then we went to, we moved uh, to a new brokerage uh, and both of us ended up going at the same time. And we partnered together about six months after that. Okay. And then we started building a, a real estate team at that point. And so the market was still in free fall pretty much literally in the, at that time. So every deal that we were doing was with buyers that were purchasing bank owned properties. Yeah. And um, so a lot of them were investors that were buying hold. They were planning to ride out the market. And then that kind of went on for a couple of years. And then we um, maybe, I don't know, maybe 2011 or so, uh, some of these investors that were buying these properties, they were, they were leaning very heavily on me to get them renovated and, you know, get a painter in there, get the flooring done, you know, yeah. get all this stuff done. And then they would just rent them out. And I was doing all this work for them essentially to get the buy side of the deal. So 3% yeah. of the deal. And of, at, at some point we get the property completely ready for the renter. And, the, and one of the investors says to me, he's like, well, you know, how much would that sell for? And I'm like, I don't know, let me look. And about 35,000 more than you paid for it. And he's like, We'll sell it. So that was kind of the, the, the beginning of the flipping, you know? Yeah. And so we started at that point um, flipping properties and I'm still doing a lot of the work and, and, you know, my part of the deal, I was getting essentially the 3% on the list and the 3% on the, on the, on the uh, buy side. And that, but it was just a lot, way too much work for that amount of pay. Yeah. And so we had a, we met with the investor and we just said, Hey, listen, man, we'll continue to do this relationship where I bring you the deal. You know, I manage the renovations and then we resell it, but we're going to have to structure a partnership that works for both of us, not just for you. Cause at sure. that point he was making all of the, all of the profit on the sales. Yeah. And so we structured a, a deal and, um, we still work together to this day. I mean, he's still one of my closest friends and we've added a few other investors. Um, but that's kind of how, how the investment side started. Does that yeah. answer your question? Or? Yeah, that's a great partnership. So that started in, when did that partnership uh, start? Oh, geez, uh, probably 2011 or 12. That's so, good. I mean, he's, he's a, a great friend of mine that this yeah. guy that, that I've known for years, even before I was in real estate. So he was one of the elders at my church when I lived in, a, in another state. So nice. And then he, he started investing down here and we still do do stuff together now. Cool. So one of the things that um, when I first had, when I was first talking to Eddie, or maybe it was our first conversation, you mentioned um, that you guys have been buying a lot of properties 
for yourself yeah. that you're owning together and personally. So um, you've bought now 36 homes, either for your business or for yourself personally in the last two years. Yeah, is that about, right? about two years. So we, um, what happened was I was flipping all these properties in the capital gains on a flip is, is, is really high. So yeah. at the time when we started, you know, the, when Obama Obama was in office and the capital gains rate, I think it was the maximum rate was 39.5% or something like that. Yeah. And so we would do all this work and our average flip, we were making about $32,000. So we would split that with the investor. That means we'd get 16 and Eddie and I'd split that. It means I'd get eight and yeah. then we'd give 39% of that to the government. And so I'd be left with like, you know, $4,500 and it's a, a whole lot of work to yeah. get that kind of pay at the back end. Sure. And so... Um, maybe about two years ago or so, you know, I started listening to the bigger pockets podcast and figuring out, man, we should make these things go into long-term capital gains instead of short term. And how yeah. would we do that by keeping them as rentals? And so we started acquiring a bunch of rental properties. That's killer, man. So that's, so, that's yeah. buying a ton of properties in a really short amount of time. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. It's a lot of properties. And you're yeah. still buying today. Yeah. Oh, still yeah. out looking for deals. Yep. Our, our goal for the end of this year is 50 properties. Uh, the end of three years, I'm looking for 200, 200 doors. I don't care wow. if they're single family. Currently, all of our deals are single family, but yeah. I'm open to apartment buildings or whatever. So yeah, to get there, that's killer, man. Whatever it takes. <laughs> so I wrote um, down like why real estate investing versus obviously you've got a pretty successful traditional real estate team also, right? You guys have yeah some buyers agents, some listing agents, people doing prospecting, somebody running the team. So you've got some income coming from that. Obviously, it makes sense to do uh, a portion in real estate. That's your primary business. But uh, why have you guys decided to go all in and really double down in real estate versus kind of spreading out into some of the more popular or more passive investment? So for, for me, there's a couple of things. I mean, the reason for investing when you have a decent income is because the, the, the reason for the decent income is so that you can invest in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't care if you make $500,000 a year or a million dollars a year, if someone shuts off that faucet, you know, y you're in trouble. So I yeah. want passive income, you know, horizontal income is extremely important to me and just figuring out how to get it was, was, was key for me. But the reason why we're doing it in real estate versus stocks or something else is just because it's what I understand. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm knee deep in it every single day and I can, I can see a deal because I'm, you know, they're coming across your desk over and over and over. And eventually you, you see, Hey man, this one, this one's got some potential. Yeah. And so it's what I know, you know, that's the, that's the bottom line. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a, a Henry Ford quote and I'll probably butcher it completely, but he says something like, you know, uh, some people say, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but I say, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket like a hawk. Yeah. And he did pretty well for himself. So I, I'm yeah. kind of, I kind of like that, you know, it's a good personal model for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I do believe in doing other investments though. I mean, if I had an opportunity to do something else, I mean, I would look at it, Yeah. but this is just the thing that I feel like it, I have the most opportunity available to me, Yeah. you know, right now. So cool. That's why we do that. So you said you're going to buy some more homes. Your goal is to get to 200. And we hear people talk about and say, you know, the market's too high. I'm going to wait and sit it out and see what happens. I'm not sure if now's a good time to buy. It doesn't seem like it's slowing you down at all. So being yeah. in real estate, seeing kind of both sides, what do you think about the market we're in right now? What do you see as far as inventory, buyer, seller market? Is it still a good time to be going in and buying houses? You know, it's funny because for probably like three years, I've been going to the, you know, Keller Williams family reunion events and yeah. they're talking about this, this shift is coming, the shift is coming. And we've been yeah, thinking like that. 2015, 2016, they started <laughs> saying it. Yeah, but for us, I have not seen that happening in our market yet. Like right now, it's definitely still a seller's market. Yeah. Um, and so do I think we're at the top? I definitely think we're near the top. I, I do believe the market's going to cycle somewhat. I don't think there's near as much bad debt out there for one thing. And yeah. so I don't believe it's going to be a crash. It's going to be like a five or 10% adjustment, which is, is not, you know, if you're a buyer looking to buy your own house to live in, it's not worth delaying your life over five or 10% because it's going to come back as the market goes back up, you know? So, yeah. so I don't, I don't really, I, I, I think it's still a great time to buy. The market still has some room to go up. I believe, you know, probably for at least like the next year or year and a half. 
Um, but who knows, you know, when it's going to come down, but I do believe it'll adjust at some point. It just kind of has to, because income is not rising as fast as the market. So at some point it just gets very difficult for buyers to, to continue buying. But the other side of that same coin is the, the other thing that that Gary uh, Keller has shared at the family reunions is that, is the, um, the fact that there's a shortage of housing, like they didn't build as many houses for, you know, almost 10 years. Yeah. They've been way behind on the New number they're building. Just halted completely. Right. And so because of that, like inventory is still low, like yeah. it's still and And so I don't know, you know, which lever is going to cause a change because inventory is still low, even though it's getting harder and harder for, for people to buy, they still need a place to live and inventory is really low. And, and it's, yeah. and we're seeing like a huge increase in rental prices, like dramatically right. they're going way up. And so, so that's like going to 6% over the last 12 months. There was a study that came out. Yeah. I mean, and that, and that may be a nationwide study. I would say where we are, it's at least that, you yeah. know, I mean, if not more. So um, it's putting major pressure on people like, man, I, I really have to buy cause I can't afford these rents. Yeah. And so um, I don't know. I, I think it's still a great time to buy. And I think that we are towards the top of a market, but I don't believe the adjustment is going to be that severe. So yeah. it doesn't really matter if you're looking to move into the house and live there, you know, long term. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're a long term buy and hold investor. You'll ride right through the the downturn. I, I seriously do not expect rents to adjust more than you know a few hundred bucks. Okay. So at the most, so as long as you have a good. Uh, margin in between what your your debt service is and what you're collecting in rent, you should be fine. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I kind of agree. We're not really seeing uh, a slowdown at all in the markets that we primarily serve. Yeah. I'll so see we've got good job growth. We've got big employers still moving in the area. We're already, I mean, I don't know if you saw this, you probably did because I know you do a lot of out of state and you do a lot of lead in your traditional business like we do. And we're we're having a ton of people fleeing weather so they're trying to get out of the northeast and trying to get into a more moderate climate yeah and that's never going to stop like yeah. people are can continue to migrate down from the you yeah. know the the cold states and they have you know my, their housing prices are dramatically higher than ours yeah. so so to no them state income tax here yeah to them the prices are still cheap down here you know yeah so. And then people fleeing high tax states. So right. we had a lot of those calls come in and a lot of people looking who are trying to get out of California and they're looking for, you know, no state income tax, still moderate climate. So right. I think our, our market is unique in that we have the tourism supporting it. We have good job growth coming into the state. We've got moderate climate, favorable tax scenario. So yeah, um, I don't see anything changing dramatically soon. Um, uh, uh, on wood now I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna curse us but yeah i think we're in good shape yeah I, I think so too i would totally agree still a seller's market i mean yeah it's still very very low inventory at least where we are so yeah i'm sure are you seeing the same down here yeah we're still we have seen it come up so we were riding about two and a half to three months of inventory for a long time and a lot of the smaller neighborhoods around here are bumping up to like four months four and a half months okay um but still a decently strong seller's market our median days on market is still 62 days so okay that's pretty darn good i think yeah that's still really low yeah Yeah. so cool um so when you talk about deals buying 36 homes in two years is super impressive going to 200 is going to be an even bigger feat where do you go to look for these houses are you just finding them on the mls and you pick them off on the mls are you going down in person to the courthouse steps. Everybody hears about the courthouse and county auctions. Where do you like to go to find deals and what types of deals do you buy for yourself? Okay. Um, what I, we buy from every source. So I, the sources that I, you know, my, the ones I use the most are direct to seller, um, which means a, a house that's off market. We, I go to the courthouse sales. So in Lake County, the sales still in person in Orange County, it's online. So you can, you can, you know, just bid from your computer and buy buy them online. The, um, it's probably nice still having the in-person. That's kind of cool. Yeah. It's, but I mean, it's okay. It's like, it's funny there. I don't know that either. I mean, we've bought actually on the online ones as well. And, and I don't, I don't think we've done just as well either way. Yeah. But the, the thing, the thing is with, with buying from the courthouse steps, is you have to 
do your own title work up front and you and you have to be very comfortable with risk. So there's a lot of stuff that people, you know, if somebody's living in the property, for example, if it's a tenant, the laws have just changed on that, that, that allow tenants to stay, you know, through the life of their lease and they can fake their lease and you would have to fight to prove that it was a fake lease. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of, a lot of, uh, risk involved with the yeah. foreclosure sales that people, you know, if a, if a lien is there on the property, you have to pay it off. If there's, you know, in our case, there's a lot of times there'll be a water lien because the people moved out and it's been vacant for three years and there's the water lien continues to accrue. And, and so there's, there's, it's a, it's a challenge. I mean, you just got to know what you're doing. That's all I would say. It's definitely not a beginner, place to find deals. Yeah. But I mean, we buy off the MLS. I buy from wholesalers. I buy from other real estate agents. They'll call me and say, Hey, I, I got this deal. Do you want to buy, you know, other, um, you know, other people that buy from the courthouse, sometimes they'll buy one and then they'll sell it to me, you know? Yeah. So, so it's, it's one of those things that really anywhere I can get a deal, I'll, I'll, I'll find it. I look at all the sources, you know, yeah. online auctions is a good one too. You know, so, like auction.com or HubZoo. Yeah. So when you're going direct to seller, um, is that like you drive by, the house looks ugly, it's overgrown, and you're door knocking? Or yeah. are you... Sometimes. Um, <laughs> are you buying like list of people? Like how do you find direct to seller? Because it seems like if you can get in before it forecloses or yeah. if you can kind of cut out the middleman, it seems like that's the ideal situation. So... Um, I have a direct to seller website that is just like a we buy houses website. Yeah. And that's one way that leads come in. Now, um, I also drive by and see the long grass and go go back and skip trace that property to find the owner and 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 contact them directly. I mean, that's worked sometimes. It doesn't work all the time, but yeah. but I've um, the direct to seller is my favorite way to do it because you know, you can actually, you have some time to evaluate the property yeah. and then negotiate a deal versus like at the courthouse, there, there's very little time or opportunity to see inside the property. And you may, you everybody's may, on it at the same time. Everybody's on it. You're bidding against multiple other professional investors. So yeah. it's who's willing to take the least profit is, is essentially what that is, where when you're direct to seller, you can, you know, you have a little bit more control over the situation, Yeah, but, but both are, both are, uh, are challenging. I mean, when you, when you go direct to seller the way that you're talking about, like, you know, you see the long grass and you knock on the door. Um, it's just a lot of times it's hard to find those people yeah. or, or to get them. But one thing, and I'll share this some other time, maybe we'll, you know, do another, another podcast someday. And I'll talk about creative real estate investing, which is where, you know, sometimes we'll incorporate stuff like subject to purchases, you know, buying a property subject to somebody's mortgage yeah. or um, lease, options. lease options and things like that. And, and those have come to me really more organically where somebody comes to us and says, Hey, I have this problem. My, you know, this person passed away. We have this property. We can't afford the mortgage. There's not very much equity. What can we do? And so that's another way that we've been able to go, you know, direct to seller and, and solve somebody's problem with real yeah. estate. Uh, where it worked out for us as an investment, like a long-term investment. Yeah, cool. So, All right, so where are you seeing, so you're doing some courthouse, you're doing some direct-to-seller, you got the website, and then when you let people know, hey, I'm an investor, I'm open to looking at and evaluating deals, people that you know start to bring you deals, you start to attract those opportunities. Um, where are you finding them? Are there certain parts of Central Florida where you're like, man, that's a hot pocket, there's tons of activity there and I don't expect you to give away you know all your secrets but yeah. if you're looking to invest or if you're um, wanting to look at properties or just meet people who are investing and see that market where are you seeing that right now in Central Florida like if you're a new investor and you're wanting to get into the market yeah okay f so for me you know most all of the stuff that we buy is in you know Orange and Lake County uh, maybe a little bit in Seminole mm -hmm. but I'm so I'm kind of focused in that general area. I'm not finding them in other parts of the of the state. Although I wouldn't be opposed to it, it's just I don't have, um, I, I I'm not I don't have like construction teams in those areas. So I'd have to yeah. build out like new subcontractor lists and stuff like that. Sure. But what I what I would say if you're a new investor, if if you're a real estate agent and you're gonna start investing, um, I would start with you know the MLS deals and uh, and the uh, online auctions. Yeah. And then 
the as far as the you know you're asking where I would go I mean I would go to the you know CFRI events or the the GORIA the Greater Orlando Real Estate Investors Association um, I would go to those those events and meet people there's you know bigger pockets meetups bigger pockets uh, podcast and website has like these meetups where people all around the country get together you can start your own meetup so just meeting other investors but yeah. for me the the wholesalers that I've met I've met at those events yeah and then um, they're they're guys that like a guy I closed on a house yesterday that this guy called me and he said hey you bought this house over here. And we got another one tied up that's almost the same price. Are you interested? And I was like, well, where is it? And and he so he was a wholesaler from like Miami that had a property tied up up in Lake County and somehow found out that I bought this property nearby that one. And uh two for one. And and called me. And but I'd bought that other one maybe like two years before. So like he went through um, you know, through the I don't know, I don't know if he bought a list of like you know, properties that are owned by absentee owners or whatever, and was calling through that or the, yeah. near the property. Or, I don't know, but um, but really, invest wholesalers will come to you if you I mean, you don't have to look very hard to find a wholesaler and get them to come to you. Yeah. So wholesalers for people who maybe they're a beginning investor, maybe they're a traditional homeowner. Um, wholesalers are people who kind of they're not representing buyers, they're not representing sellers, they're not buying properties themselves. They're just basically hunting deals. Yeah, a wholesaler is going to get a property under contract direct to seller, so they're good at they're good at, you know, making the connections with the seller and negotiating is is kind of their specialty. They're yeah, gotcha. I mean, you could look at them as like an acquisitions person really. Yeah. And the way they get paid is they get it they, you know, they get it under contract for 120 and sell it to you for 125 mm-hmm. and then you go in and and flip it and you know, sell it for 189 when you're done or whatever, you know, that's the kind of thing. And they just assign the contract to you. They'll either assign it or they'll do a double closing and they usually try to make, you know, a few thousand in the middle. But I mean, some of them will make 10 or 30,000 for a wholesale fee. The wholesale fees, whatever they can negotiate. So, um, but I've had, I've had good luck with some wholesalers and a lot of times the deals just don't work for me. It's like all of the meat's been taken out of the middle and and doesn't work. So, I mean, I've, I've done wholesale deals primarily with wholesalers I know. Yeah, uh, that that don't that you know that know kind of the margins that we need, and then bring me the deal. We'll take way. a smaller piece of fifteen deals I do with you, then try and yeah. If, if they try to get all there. of it out of the middle, then it do, it just doesn't end up working for me. You yeah. know, most of the time. So, but there but there is. I mean, they're doing a lot of business right now, so there's definitely deals being done by wholesalers, and usually they're selling them to cash buyers, long term buy and hold investors, or flippers. Yeah. So, so. cool. So. Um, tell us a little bit about specifically um, what's a really good deal that you've done. Where'd you find it? What did the look? What did it look like? What were the numbers? Um, and then, if you have a deal that didn't go well, where you have some experience you can share, we can help some other people avoid losing some money or absolutely. getting into a bad situation. Oh, absolutely! I, I uh, I'll start with the ones that that didn't go well. So, okay. um, so one thing. There, there, I'll, I'll share a couple of these if you, you if we got time. Yeah, for so, sure. So the first one that we bought that didn't go well, we bought one on the on the court uh, from the courthouse, but the online auction through Orlando. Yeah, and it was down. It's down here actually, right here by your office is on Brown Avenue or something oh, yeah. like that. And so they're just south of the Curry Ford. Yeah, yeah, super super not like a cobblestone type road or whatever it is or like brick brick road yeah and anyway eddie and i get down there to see the property and there's a gigantic tree like laying on top of it there's like live termites crawling around that you can see inside the house and so it was for sure a tear down yeah um and you know we just paid one hundred twenty thousand dollars for it so you know fortunately the thing that saved us was the fact that we were in an area that the dirt was probably worth that you know what i mean yeah but uh it ended up becoming a really long process like we had to we had to get permits to tear the house down and then and then find a builder and build a new construction home on the property and then resell it i mean we probably you know i, I would I, I guess that one didn't work well but kind of ended up working out in the end we made like eighty thousand dollars on it but it probably took us a year and a half yeah. when our our plan was definitely not that long term yeah so we had to we kind of had to dig our way out of that one yeah um another one i, I would say so sorry to interrupt but no go ahead 
when you bought that, you didn't even do a drive by. You don't no. walk on the property. You nope. just you see location. You look at comps. You're like, let's do it. Yeah, on. and that's that was what not to do. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just to be clear on that, because like that did. It's convenient. To it, do it, it, it that way. It, while it worked out, but it was it, it, like that's one of the ways that we found out. Like you know, don't do that. Yeah. It's overconfidence is what it was. I mean, we've done you know a hundred probably way over a hundred flips at this point. And, and when, when we did that one, you know, we hadn't lost money on any deals. So we're pretty confident in our abilities. And then, you know, we got into that one and realized you better be careful or you could end up getting into something that you can't get out of. So another one that was similar is we bought a property that is unfinished. So you have a house there's, it's like standing there, but there's never been a CEO on this house. So, um, you bought a house kind of in the middle of construction, Um, somebody started it, they either not uncommon builder only had financing for the first phase, second round doesn't come through, you know, overspend, blow their budget maybe. So you get this house that's kind of, and and not uncommon right in the middle of things. And what does that look like trying to finish out a project like that? That's probably one of the biggest mistakes we've ever made is doing that. And the re there's a lot of reasons for it, but one reason is because if you're used to flipping, you can use a roofer and you can use a flooring person and you can use a painter and so forth. But when you have a a property that's never had the certificate of occupancy, then you have to have plumbing inspections and electrical inspections and all this stuff. And you have to have a a general contractor managing the entire process. Yeah. So you can't do that unless you are a general contractor. And if you're not, you have to hire one that can manage all these subs and get all these inspections done. And so it's much more complicated than it seems like you see this house that's almost done and you think, man, we can finish this out real easily. But if all these open permits are, are hanging out there, then it, it's a it's a big nightmare. So I, the only way I'd ever buy an unfinished house ever again is if I was planning to tear it down. Yeah. Uh, I mean, absolutely, that's the only way. It has to be the value of the lot for me uh, because you just don't know what was done before, and that's the problem. Right. Nobody wants to put their name on it. You know, no yeah. no, no contractor wants to say, yeah, I'll, I'll pull the permits because now they're on the hook for stuff that was done by somebody else. Yeah. You know, maybe years earlier. So. Right. So that's the... We had a similar uh, challenge, similar house up the street from a home that a builder we partnered with built. And they started construction. It was a really wacky floor plan, but they got in trouble. Um, So we started kind of doing some digging, thinking like, hey, we've got this house. We're already marketing. We're already building buyer pool for the area. Already got vendors who are coming over and subcontractors to do work on the street. Like, wouldn't it be great to pick up another deal a few doors down? And no, the answer is no. Mechanics to that. <laughs> liens, you know, eighty something thousand dollars in mechanics liens, and uh, you know, rotting trusses in the front yard that they oh, were yeah. still wanting to sell with the house, and we're saying reusable, so it was, it was hairy, and uh, yeah. And did somebody, you do it? We did not do it. Somebody else has picked it up. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Good for you. All, <laughs> that's all I can tell you is it, it is not what it is not for the faint of heart, man. Yeah. It's a it's a problem. Yeah. So yeah, that's one. I mean, most of the ones that we've did that didn't work out were stuff like that that we didn't see. Yeah. Um. You know where we, you know, either bought from the courthouse or didn't see it. Yeah. And the, and the other thing is when you you know you you guess wrong on your on your um repair costs, you know, repair costs is super important. And sure. I mean, there's been times when, you know, we go into it thinking, you know, I think we're going to get by with this roof and the air conditionings are working, everything's good. And then the moment you buy it, you know, not only does the roof end up needing replaced, but so do both air conditioning systems and the septic, you know, field yeah. is, is ruined. So then you're, you know, right there, you're off by, you know, $40,000 Yeah, and that can be, you know, almost your whole profit. So, I mean, fortunately for us, we've been, we've been very blessed to, you know, get through these situations where we just at least got our money back or maybe our money back plus five or $6,000, yeah. which, which means we live to fight another day, but, right. but, it, and it's a learning, it's a learning lesson. You're either, you're going to learn one way or the other you're either going to learn by instruction or you're going to go through pain like that and and learn from that and for us you know we've gone through some pain yeah for sure (laughs) so so what's one that's worked really well what's been like the home run grand slam uh pleasant surprise or just like everything worked I'm almost afraid to to share some of these because they because then people think like oh this is 
you know, I could, I like, I would never want to plan on on doing these this way. And it's not like if I was teaching a new investor, I would never tell them to do this. Yeah. But the one, a couple that have worked out really well for us. One of them was um, this property on 27 acres, and it was way out in the middle, like in between um, Eustis and like Sorrento area and uh, Deltona or or uh, Deland kind of. Yeah. So it was out there in the middle of nowhere, like probably like 30 minutes out into the middle of nowhere. And it was on 27 acres, and it was a weird little house, like a t- small house, like a 1,600-square-foot house that had several levels. Like, you know, when you go in, you go up one step, you go across, you go down a step into the living room, you know, like yeah. that kind of thing. And and the house, I think, was only 1,600 square feet. And so we're – or maybe even less than that. And so we were just thinking, man, I have no idea. Like, you don't ever see 20 acres selling with a small little house like that. Yeah. Especially one with a weird floor plan. So – this guy wanted me to buy it. This one came to us directly, uh, wanted me to buy it. And I was like, let me just list it. I'm like, I was so afraid of buying this house because yeah. I had no idea what it would sell for. And and eventually, I mean, the guy kept on wanting me to do it. And I was like, look, man, I don't want to pay more than 150 And he kept coming back like, could you do 175 And I was, I was like scared to death of doing it. So long story short, I finally agreed to do, I think we did, came in the middle like about 170 And um the house sold for like three oh five, and we did and we did do um, we did probably a forty or fifty thousand dollar renovation on it, um, but we our total profit on that deal and I and I, I'm a little fuzzy on the exact numbers, but it was around you know seventy eight thousand dollars I think or eighty thousand dollars, and so it was it turned out really well yeah but it it was a lot higher risk too and that's why I'm saying you know for a new new investor I would never want them to you know, go find some oddball weird house out in the middle of nowhere because those are the exact same one you could lose a lot of money on. Yeah. And so for me, I felt like I made him an offer low enough that if everything went bad, I could probably sell the land for that amount of money. Yeah. And and that's kind of... Yeah, that seems like a lot of acreage for... Well, some of it was wet. There There was probably, gosh, I'm trying to remember, maybe maybe... 10 acres or eight, you know, 10 acres high and dry. And then there's some wetlands yeah. that were incorporated in there as well. So it wasn't all, all high and dry, but I, I thought like, you know what, the 10, eight, the, the part that's high and dry is probably worth the $175,000 offer. Yeah. So if we can't, if for some reason, you know, the house is inhibiting us from selling it, we may be able to sell it as, as land and still get, at least get our money back. Yeah. So I, I would say in those cases, be super conservative. Like, ultra conservative where you, you know, pretty much can't lose money. Cause on, on any, like the, the new investors should invest in a neighborhood where there's a thousand houses that are exactly the same and they can exactly pinpoint what their, their resale price is going to be. Yeah. And they can know exactly when the roof was done and the air conditioning were, were put in. I mean, that that's where you should start. You, you should, know where your, what your buyer looks like. Yes, got- exactly. And you know what the range is. It's not like there's this hundred thousand dollar range. You know yeah. this house is gonna sell between two twenty and two twenty five. You know? Yeah. I mean you can pinpoint that. That's where they should start. I mean yeah. you know, doing it like something that's oddball is extremely risky. Mo- mo- most flippers and you know gurus will tell you never touch those. Just don't do it. Yeah. it, it what I found is we've made really, really good money on some of those because open door won't buy them. You know, a lot of other investors won't buy them. So, yeah. th- you know, they're, these people are, are really, really desperate to sell. You can actually get that margin that you need to, mm-hmm. to make yourself feel safe. And so I've done good on those, but, but I, I wouldn't, I, it's, you, you have to be very conservative. Yeah. You know? Cool. So you mentioned, so that's good advice for a new investor on where to start. And you mentioned like the real estate investing clubs, which um, CFRI and then yeah, Central Florida Real Estate Investors Association. Yeah, so, so a couple of those bigger pockets. Um, you mentioned you're a big fan. I know Eddie said he was a huge fan of their huge. community. Yeah, I love bigger pockets. I've I've learned learned so much from them. Yeah, you know, so so those are good resources for somebody who wants to get into investing or somebody who wants to find good deals. What about um, what about finding, how do you find an agent if you're an investor or you want to start investing and you want to buy an investment property? What should they be looking for in an agent to help them get get a good deal, help them kind of learn the investing process? Sure. Help them kind of keep an eye out for landmines that you're not going to see. How would you go about finding or where do you find agents who are really savvy or good at finding investment properties? Yeah, that's so that's a good question. And I think there's there's kind of a, 
like a long answer to that. First, the, the short answer would be find an agent with a lot of experience. Yeah. The longer answer is most agents with a lot of experience don't have much time to spend digging through deals to try to find, you know, deals for, uh, that they want to give away, you yeah. know, necessarily. I mean, if they're not, you'd have to find an agent that's not doing investing on their own Yeah. if, or otherwise they may buy the deal. Yeah. So, so there's, there's, there's kind of that, that balance there, but sure. I think you definitely want someone that has a lot of experience and that can give you really good advice on your comps and your after repair value because a newer agent will get you into a lot of trouble. So I'll give yeah. you, an, I'll give you a good example of how that can, that can go wrong. I had a guy contact me that had six houses that he'd bought with a, with a newer agent in Orlando. Um, and the agent was not experienced, uh, sold, sold this guy, these six houses and four of the six had the garage closed in and the agent had comped them with houses of similar size without a garage closed in. So in other words, like a 2,800 square foot house was really a 2,400 square foot house with a closed in garage. And he was comping the 2,800 square foot house with other 2,800 square foot houses, which what we found is buyers want a garage. Yeah. So they discount the price of the house for that closed in space. They don't increase the price They're, they, You know what I mean? They yeah. want it. They, and, and, and the guy, the investor w- kept on telling me, John, listen, you know, people never park in their garage in Florida. They just fill it full of stuff. I'm like, listen, that may be true, but in their mind before they buy that house, they think they're going to park in the garage. They yeah. may fill it full of bicycles and, and crap, but it, but it, it the, before they buy it, you can't dash their hopes and dreams of being able to park in their garage because that's what they think they're going to do, you know? Yeah. And by closing it in, so anyway, the long story short is this guy lost money on every one of those houses and, um, wow. and, and a lot of money too. And he, he, he fired his other agent, hired me to sell them. And, you know, I, I basically, before I even took the listings, told him, I was like, listen, you, you know, I can't, I don't think I can come even anywhere close to selling these for what you're hoping to get for them, Man. you know, and, and, and he understood the, the, the issue going into it, but it was, uh, you know, that's, that's what ha- can happen if you get the wrong agent that's, that's not experienced and gives you the, a false, you know, after repair value. Yeah. So you want to find someone that I would say, you know, go to those, those CFRI events, go, you yeah. know, events like, you know, the, um, meetups and things like that and find an agent that kind of understands the investment world is willing to to work hard for you and then and then maybe may already working with other investors yeah yeah somebody that understands that that whole world but also yeah. you know somebody that i mean you gotta you gotta value their time that's what i would say don't don't waste their time yeah maybe even bring them deals like hey what you know have them set you up on searches but then bring them the ones you're most interested in and let them analyze just those deals yeah you know and then you know I mean, that's, I don't know if that answers the question yeah, or not. Yeah, for sure. So, Cool. So um, kind of wrapping up, you've got a lot of businesses that you guys do. You help traditional buyers buy homes to live in. Sure. You sell homes to investors. You list a lot of property for sale. Uh, you have a property management business. Yeah. So um, in addition to that, you know, what kind of clients and customers can you guys serve? Can you guys help? Do you like to work with? If somebody's looking to do business in real estate, who should reach out to you and um, how can you kind of help, help sure. people who might be looking? Absolutely, man. We, our, our, our like primary market, I would say, is North Lake County, you know, North Orlando, kind of the the Mount Dora, Eustis, uh, Apopka, Tavares, Leesburg, that area. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have a couple agents on our team in Claremont. So that's the tr- that's the area that would I would say is our wheelhouse. Yeah. And then as far as you know, buyers and sellers. I mean, we we work with you know we have uh, you know probably the largest uh, producing real estate team in Lake County in that er- in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the investment side, you know, I am looking for you know primarily people that have some money that they want to invest into into flips or um, mortgages. So I do okay. a lot of private m- loans, like on those properties that we bought, yeah. we did private mortgages with people to buy them and get them renovated. And then I refied them into, into long-term debt. So, gotcha. so that would be the, the investor side, but um, we can also help people that have a real estate problem. I mean, that's my, my favorite thing really right now is to help somebody that has a problem that is not easily solved. So yeah. an example would be, I had a lady who, her mother had a rental property, so it wasn't her primary, but it was her rental. She moves in with her daughter, and the tenant immediately stops paying the bill. So the daughter is now paying for the the 
the rent rental um, mortgage, and then the mom has to go to memory care facility. So now the mom's in memory care and the daughter's paying for the rental mortgage and the memory care facility and the tenant won't move out and the daughter doesn't have the money wow. to, to, to evict them. Yeah. So they're like trying to figure out what to do. So I came in, I bought that property direct from the daughter, subject to the mortgage, did all the legal work that needed to be dealt with because the mother was still alive, but on this mortgage. So, you know, there was a lot of uh, attorney work that had to be done first. Yeah. And then I evicted the guy, kicked him out, and then... Um, you know, kept that as a long-term rent, rental property. But wow. what happened was she couldn't get, you know, government assistance for the mom's memory care while she while this mom had this asset in her name. Yeah. So she would have to wait three or four years for the bank to finally get around to foreclosing. Yeah. And be paying be paying for the memory care all that time unless you know someone like me came in and, and kind of helped do that do help them through that situation. So that's sure. really my favorite thing is somebody that's in in kind of a a pickle with their their real estate and they need help and then we figure out what what the best solution is cool so well awesome man well thank you for coming down yeah my um, pleasure there's a lot of good info in there about investing for sure um definitely people in lake county i think i can't think of a better team up there to help people and assist people i know you guys do a great job and um that's a lot of good info man really appreciate it yeah thanks man all right take care appreciate it